Hi, in this video, let's take a look at Owen's latest multifunctional handheld scope meter in its HDS200 series. This is an HDS2102S, a dual channel 100 MHz bandwidth handheld oscilloscope with built in digital multimeter and arbitrary waveform generator. It was released not too long ago as an update to the HDS272S 70 MHz bandwidth version I reviewed a while back. Quite a few of my viewers had asked me whether I could do a review of the latest model from Owen. So when Banggood asked me whether I'd like to test this scope out, I happily obliged. As usual, if after watching this video you decided to get one or are just interested to take a look, please check out the product link in the video description below. With the addition of the HDS2102S, the HDS200 series now has three bandwidth choices. The 242 model is the 40 MHz version, the 272 model is the 70 MHz version, and now, of course, we have the 2102 model. This is the 100 MHz version. And the versions with an S at the end of the model number all have built-in arbitrary waveform generators. Personally, if I were to buy one, I would definitely choose the S version with the arbitrary waveform generator as it only costs an extra $30 or so. Now I just placed the 272S alongside with the 2102S. As you can see that they look pretty much identical from a glance. The only noticeable differences are the model numbers printed here. As you can see that 272S and 2102S. The packaging and accessories between these two models also come in pretty much identical. Everything comes in this nice soft instrument pouch. Inside you get a USB cable, two BNC to banana plugs, your charging adapter, and a set of uh, multimeter probes here. The only real material difference between the supplied accessories between these two scopes is the oscilloscope probe. For the 272 model, the supplied probe is this O1 3070, which is a 70 MHz bandwidth version, whereas for the 2102, the supplied probe is this O1 3100, which is, of course, a 100 MHz bandwidth version, as you'd expect. Now, if we compare the specs, you will see that the differences between these two models are small, but quite important. For instance, one thing immediately jumps out is that for the 100 MHz version, the sampling rate has doubled. Now, instead of a 250 MHz samples per second, we have 500 MHz samples per second for single channel operation. Of course, for dual channel operation, the bandwidth drops by half, which is quite common in many DSO designs because of the sharing of the front-end ADCs across multiple channels. And the remaining differences in specs are all correlated to the increased bandwidth. Here we can see that the sweep speed range also has some minor differences between the 2102 and the 272S. Of course, now we have this uh, one extra division for two nanoseconds, basically because of the increased bandwidth. And the HDS2102 also has a slightly faster write time compared to the 272 due to its higher bandwidth. Now everything else, including the multimeter and uh, the arbitrary waveform generator, as you can see that the specs are actually identical between these two models. So there's no other differences. Because of the increased bandwidth and the sampling rate, I'd expect to see different components used for the ADC and perhaps even the FPGA, which we'll take a look shortly when we do the teardown. Now let's power it up and take a closer look, especially on the bandwidth side. If you wanted to see a comprehensive review on all the functionalities, I'd suggest you check out my review video for the 272S version as everything else except for the oscilloscope part should be identical between the 272S and the 2102S. I will leave a link in the description below as well. Okay, so now let me power it up. And uh, similar to what we have in HDS272S, it powers up almost uh, instantaneously. Actually, let me do a comparison. Now, the first thing I noticed is actually I did not hear the relay click when I power it on. So I remember when I power on the 272S, yeah, you hear that the relay click. So there may be some minor 
firmware differences between these two versions, and it could also be hardware. So we will take a look when we open it up later, but let's uh, power them up at the same time so that we get a sense of uh, the speed here. You can see that the powering up time is actually virtually identical between these two. Now let's take a look at how well the 2102 acquires the signal automatically. And for that, I'm currently outputting a 10 MHz 1 volt peak to peak sinusoidal from my Unity UTG 962E. Originally, I wanted to do it side by side using a BNC T adapter, but for some reason, I couldn't find that T adapter. So I might need to buy more, but uh, for the time being, I'm just going to swap back and forth so you can see a comparison between these two. Now, I don't expect major differences, but uh, let's take a quick look. So now let me do the auto acquisition. And we heard the relay click, and now you can see that the signal is acquired. So let's do the same thing for the 272S. And I expect it works pretty much identically here. So let's do that. Yep, as you can see that there's really not too much difference between these two oscilloscopes here. And of course, you can do all the adjustments you want. For example, right now, if we try to do the adjustment for the vertical scale, we can certainly change that. And it's fairly responsive here. And if we, we want to change the horizontals, you can also use this knobs, uh, sorry, these buttons to change the time base. Again, it's very responsive. There's really no difference in terms of operation at this frequency between these two models here. So while we're at uh, this arbitrary waveform output, let's just uh, change a couple of waveforms and uh, just get a quick look here. We change to square wave. And of course, we expect that uh, the corners are rounded a little bit because of the frequency we're currently at. Now let's uh, change it to a ramp signal. And uh, that one, of course, we can, let's do automatic acquisition again so that uh, we can get it in view here. And now let's just do another arbitrary waveform and uh, no problem at all. So that gives you a rough idea of uh, what the signal input looks like on this HDS 2102. And now we're looking at an amplitude modulated signal. This uh, signal is a 10 MHz carrier frequency with a 100 kHz modulation frequency on top of it for the amplitude modulation. And the depth is at 100%, and you can see that we have acquired the signal with no problem. Now, of course, if you do auto acquisition, the signal actually doesn't look quite uh, correct because there's an amplitude modulation on top of it. So for that, we just manually change the time base here. As you can see, let's uh, change the time base to uh, higher, and you will see the signal with no problem. Of course, you have to change your trigger point accordingly so that you can trigger on this signal nicely. Now the same thing I have already adjusted on 01 HDS 272S, you can see that it is pretty much identical. So there's no problem at all. So these two scopes indeed behave very similarly. Of course, let's uh, adjust the trigger level a little bit. So it is uh, triggered cleanly here. So there is slightly some artifacts and slightly different because I suspect that the implementation inside is ever so slightly different. But nevertheless, you can see that these two scopes behave very, very similarly in this regard. And as you can see here is a lizard row figure displayed on a 2102S. Now one channel is inputting a 10 MHz signal, the other channel is inputting a 12 MHz signal. And let me adjust the other channel so you can see that the figure is nice and crisp and no problem at all. In fact, I can change the time scale and you can see that it uh, displays rather nicely. And for the same one microsecond time scale, let's uh, change it to the 72S. And I suspect that they are just going to be pretty much identical in this case. Yep, as you can see here, this uh, figure looks pretty much the same. So there's not much difference there as well. Now it's a moment of truth. Currently I'm outputting a signal from the AD642B signal generator into this HDS2102 and currently it's outputting a 50 MHz 
at uh, 0 dBm. So you can see that we captured this uh, signal very cleanly. Of course, that's to be expected. So let me do a couple of things. Let's uh, set it to the fastest time base at 2 nanoseconds. And let me turn on, let's see if I can figure this out. Let me turn on the measurement for the frequency. Let's see, yep, I already have frequency. So let's uh, turn it on. So as you can see here, we are measuring 50 megahertz. Now let me start increasing the frequency and we'll see the behavior on this uh, scope here. So let me increase to 70 megahertz, no problem. And uh, by the way, 70 megahertz is the maximum for the 272S. After I uh, tested out the 2102S, I'm going to kind of compare it to the 272 again, so that you get some visual comparison here. So now at 70 megahertz, no issues. And we'll do, let's go straight to the 100 megahertz as the maximum specified frequency here. No problem at all. And we do see the amplitude drop a little bit. Now, I wouldn't uh, take that into too much consideration as we don't have a proper termination here. So for this test, we really just wanna see if we are able to capture that signal or not. So right now we're able to capture that signal at 100 megahertz. And you can see that the frequency reading is uh, 100 megahertz. So let's uh, keep increasing 110. And we can still see that signal. That's not a problem. 120. No problem. We can still see that signal. Of course, the amplitude dropped quite a bit. Now, I suspect that's already above the 3 dB uh, specification, but we're going to keep increasing the frequency till at a point we can no longer measure that signal. So we get a good sense of uh, exactly how this oscilloscope behaves when we increase the frequency. So let's uh, keep increasing, 125, 26. And I noticed that actually the frequency reading dropped off. So let's see at what point it drops off. And it looks like 120 seems to be the maximum we can get. Yeah, so 120, you can see that's there. Actually, even 120 sometimes it goes on and off. So the frequency measurement circuitry may not be able to measure the frequency anymore, but nevertheless, the oscilloscope can still display that signal with no problem. So let's ignore the frequency reading and let's start increasing the signal frequency again. So now we're at uh, 130 megahertz. And you can see that that's not a problem. And let's keep increasing. So this is 140. 140 and 150, sorry, that's 150. And uh, let's uh, increase to 160. So actually that's quite impressive when you think about it. And uh, at 160, that's pretty much the highest frequency I think you can detect now. Let's uh, just keep increasing to see if we get any artifacts here. 170, okay, so 70 you can still see the waveform, of course, the amplitude significantly attenuated because the front end is uh, designed to only handle up to 100 megahertz. But nevertheless, you can see it's actually quite impressive. Uh, let's keep increasing. 180. Yeah, so you can already see that at this point, it started to have all sorts of weird artifacts. Now you can see the waveform started wiggling and uh, 180. So Okay, so now at 190, you can see that we clearly have some issues as we are not able to detect that signal anymore. So this is 200, certainly you can no longer see the signal on the scope. So for all intent and purpose, I think even though it is specified at 100 megahertz, so let's go back to 100. This is 100 realistically you can use this scope to at least get a sense of the input signal up to 150 160 megahertz with no problem i'm actually quite impressed by what i see so far definitely the improved performance has everything to do with that added uh, sampling rate here 
So what I'm curious to see next is to see how it behaves in a dual channel mode. As we know that the sampling rate will drop to 250 mega samples per second. So let me enable channel 2 here. So we will take a look. Let's see channel 2. Turn it on. Yep. As soon as we turn on channel 2, you can see that the signal degraded on the channel 1. That is to be expected, as right now the sampling rate essentially is halved. And now if I increase the frequency, I suspect that uh, we will definitely have some problem. Interestingly, we cannot measure the frequency even at 100 MHz. Let's actually lower the frequency to see at what point that frequency measurement will pick up. So now I'm at uh, 90 MHz. We were not able to pick up the frequency measurement, but the waveform is a lot cleaner right now. So let me reduce to 80 MHz. We still are not able to pick up that uh, frequency measurement. Let's do 70. No. So there may be some issue with uh, the implementation actually, because I don't see why it wouldn't be able to pick up the frequency. Maybe there's some issue with the software. So let's actually go down to 50 to see if we can pick up that frequency reading. Yeah, 50 we can. Okay. So it seems that in dual channel mode, let's see, we increase to 60. In dual channel mode, yeah, that uh, frequency measurement definitely is not as good as in the single channel measurement mode. It looks like the maximum we can measure probably is between 50 and 60. As you can see right now, we're at 60 and uh, we can barely pick up that measurement. And actually that measurement is not accurate at all. Right now we're at exactly 60, but it's showing 5988 when it was able to measure that briefly. So this is definitely something that uh, we need to pay attention. But again, most of the time you are measuring in a single channel mode when you are measuring this high frequency. So let's uh, start increasing the frequency back to 100 MHz and let's keep increasing and uh, let's observe what that waveform looks like. Right now, let's do 110. Yeah, so definitely we are not able to measure much higher than 100. Uh, so right now it's 120, you can see that the signal is totally unusable. So basically in dual channel mode, I think it's a little bit of a stretch, even at 100 MHz. But for single channel measurement, this uh, 2102, as I mentioned earlier, is very, very impressive. Now let's take a look at the same measurement on the 272S, so we can get a rough feel of uh, how much improvement the 100 MHz version has over this older model. Right now the 8642B is outputting a 50 MHz 0 dBm signal and we can see that it is displayed and measured correctly on the 272S. So now let me increase it to the 70 MHz which is the maximum specified frequency range for the 272. And you can see that we can measure that signal with no problem and uh, the waveform is ever so little bit of a fuzzy here. That's because the front end you know, has a hard time of uh, dealing with this uh, high frequency here. At the maximum specified frequency, we can see that the signal quality displayed here is not as good as uh, we had on the 2102 when we were measuring 100 MHz at its maximum frequency. And that, I suspect, is uh, mainly due to the limited sampling rate on this scope and also there's some clock jitter so that the signal is broadened a little bit so it becomes a little bit fuzzy. And now let me increase the frequency a little bit more. So let's do 80 MHz. And you can see that the signal quality drops a little bit more as we increase the frequency. So let's do 90 MHz. And of course we cannot measure the frequency that high anymore. So let's keep increasing the frequency to 100 MHz. You can see that the signal degraded significantly and we're approaching a frequency that would no longer be useful for measuring the signal anymore. So let's uh, take a look at the frequency at 110. Yeah, you can see definitely this is uh, not 
able to pick up the sinusoidal anymore. So for all intent and purposes, the measurement frequency is probably capped at 100 megahertz at best for a single channel operation. So let me change it back to 70 megahertz as it's a specified maximum measurement frequency. And let's uh, try to change it to dual channel mode to see how it behaves as I don't believe I had done this uh, measurement before. So let's enable the channel 2. Yep, as you can see that for the HDS272, actually the performance is a lot worse in dual channel mode compared to the 2102 at its maximum specified frequency. So basically, you know, it's barely useful here. But that's also to be expected because right now the sampling rate essentially is at 125 mega samples per second. It can barely supply two samples per uh, sinusoidal cycle. So that is why the measured waveform looks uh, rather interesting here. So let's uh, reduce the frequency here. Let's uh, reduce to 60 megahertz and uh, it's not getting that much better let's do 50 megahertz it's getting slightly better but we're not able to pick up that frequency measurement let's do 40. so at 40 megahertz you can see that that's actually more like a normal sinusoidal waveform again now we know the limitations of these two scope meters and uh, in my opinion, in both single channel operation and uh, dual channel operation, the 2102S has significant improvement over the 272S. Before I do the teardown, I just want to take a quick look at the power consumption of this unit. Let's first measure the standby power consumption. By the way, the battery used in this 2102 is exactly the same as the battery used in the 272. As you can see here, that's the 2200 milliamp hour lithium ion battery. There are two of them, they're in parallel. So let's uh, take a look. You can see that we're drawing 30 microamp. That's actually very good, but not as good as what we saw in the 272S, the lower bandwidth version. That one draws, if I remember correctly, only about 17, 18 microamp. Now that's that said, that's a very small amount of uh, current draw, so that should not affect your overall standby time that significantly. Now let's measure the actual power consumption when the unit powers on. By the way, I was not able to measure that power consumption using the multimeter because of the internal resistance, and I suspect that's because the power draw of this 100 megahertz version is uh, much higher than that of the 272. So let's uh, power it on, and we'll use that uh, power supply to measure the current draw here. So you can see that at uh, standby, meaning after I power it on, it draws roughly 700 milliamp. So that, in, if I remember correctly, probably is about 100 milliamps higher than the current draw on the 72. Now that is to be expected because this is a higher bandwidth version. So let's play around to see if we can see any drastic changes in the current consumption. So if I change different mode, and uh, it still stays in that 700 milliamp range. And let me turn on my different uh, channel here. And uh, yeah, so it doesn't seem to affect that much. So basically the current draw is roughly at uh, 700, 730 milliamps range that uh, you can see back there on the power supply. Now I just open it up and we can see the inside of this 2102. Now from a glance it looks pretty much identical to what we found in the 272S. I had to compare it to the photo I took with that 272S in order to spot the difference. Now the only difference I can see is in this section where that op amp is at in that 272. So that is appeared to be replaced by this smaller footprint one. And there's some minor difference in this area as well. But everything else look pretty much identical. I'm going to post that picture here as well. You can kind of uh, see for yourself. And by the way, all the high resolution teardown photos would be on my website and you can go check them out as well.
Another minor difference is that in that 272, the shielding can is covered with a copper tape, and here you can see that that's just a shielding can. Interestingly, there are two parts to it. Probably there's some components that is taller, so they had to solder on this uh, taller piece here to make sure that the entire portion is shielded. Of course, the front end may be slightly different because this is a higher bandwidth version, but uh, that's nevertheless under the shielding can, and I won't be able to remove without a lot of effort, so I'm not going to do that here. And I just flip the main board over. Now you can see this side of the board. Now from a glance, again, you can see that uh, everything looks pretty much similar to what we had in that uh, 272 teardown. The only main difference I can see is that in this 2102, they used a slightly different LCD model compared to that in the 272. Now, this LCD does look a little bit better, and you can probably see that in my video earlier when I put the 272 and the 2102 side by side. At the same setting, the LCD appeared to be ever so slightly brighter and sharper compared to the other one, but uh, it's neither here nor there. This portion of the circuitry is dedicated for the digital multimeter. Now, because in this model, the digital multimeter is essentially the same as that in the 272S, so I expect that this circuitry is pretty much identical to that. Of course, there might be a revision here or there. Up here, that's our main microcontroller, and the one used here is a GD32F303, which is an ARM Cortex-M4 microcontroller and this is the companion flash memory. So again, that is the same as all the HDS200 series. So now let me flip over the LCD and we can take a look at the circuitry on the other side here. And here is where you can see the difference. As I mentioned earlier, this is a 500 mega samples per second scope versus the 250 in the 272. So we expected that there's some changes in that sampling portion. The ADC used in this scope is a HAD1511, which is from analog device. It's a very powerful ADC. It is a 8-bit 30 mega samples per second to 1 gig samples per second analog to digital converter. Now if you remember in our 272 teardown, in that scope it used a MXT2088 which is a dual 100 mega samples per second analog to digital converter. And uh, I had suspected that in that scope's implementation, the ADC was actually overclocked by roughly 25% to achieve that 250 mega samples per second using both of the ADCs for a single channel operation. This actually explains quite a bit why we can push the envelope of the measurement bandwidth quite a bit with this oscilloscope because of this uh, excellent ADC used inside. Now I also suspect that there may be some improvement in the FPGA used in this unit as well. Unfortunately, we don't have a marking on the FPGA, so I have no idea what this one is. So as I suspected earlier in the video, that uh, these two chips are pretty much the main differences between this version and the 70 MHz bandwidth version. And again, up here, we have this uh, DAC904E, which is a 14-bit, 165 MHz sample per second digital-to-analog converter that is used for generating the arbitrary waveform. And everything else looks pretty similar to what we had in that uh, 272 teardown. So this pretty much concludes this review and the teardown video. I will post the high-resolution pictures on my website, so you can review at your own leisure. As I mentioned earlier, if you want to see a detailed review of all the bells and whistles, please check out my other review video of the HDS272S. And let me know in the comment below if there's anything you want me to test with this latest and greatest model, and I can definitely do a follow-up video if there is enough interest. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the video, and as always, remember to give it a big thumbs up, and remember to subscribe to the channel. I will catch up with you next time.